Okay, attention Red Atlas. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, all right, great. Um, happy Saturday, and welcome to the space. Is it the first time here for anybody? First time to Red Atlas, hey, welcome. All right, so this is a collective, properly run bookstore, coffee house. What that means is all the people you see working here, myself included, are owners, co-owners of this place, and we run it together through direct consensus. Uh, newer people are on their way to becoming owners. Um, it's a radically egalitarian space. We're also incubating another collective within Red Emma's called Thread, and they roast all of our coffee on site. And we have a sister project at 26 in St. Paul's called 2640, and that's an event space, which you should definitely check out. Um, but tonight, just housekeeping, really quick, really brief. No espresso beverages anymore. They're done. They're too loud. Um, and we're not going to call your name when your food's ready. You have to remember your food before it gets cold. It'll be sitting over there. Um, just pick it up 10 minutes after you order it and put your dirty dishes back in the bus bins as quietly as you can during the event. So without taking up too much more time, tonight we have the state of siege in Turkey. So this is a panel discussion tonight, it was sponsored by JHU. And before we get started, I want to shout out on another relevant event this month, which you all may be interested in. That's the refugee crisis in the Greek islands. Uh, we're going to have a report back from one of our previous collective members, Ryan Harvey, uh, returning from recent trips to Greece to work with refugee solidarity projects. So let's get started on tonight's event. Turkey, uh, War on Kurds and Academic Freedom. We have four speakers tonight and uh, let me introduce everyone. Uh, I'm Serra Hakemez from uh, Johns Hopkins University, PhD student in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, our first speaker is Mehmet, Mehmet Yüksel. Um, he is the representative of the Kurdish political party HDP in Washington DC. He is going to talk about the historical and political context in which the state of siege in northern Kurdistan are falling. And the second speaker is Michael Tasik. Uh, he is uh, a professor in the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University. And he is going to talk about patriarchy and YPG in Kobani. And the uh, third speaker is me, and I'm going to talk about the interrelationship of law and politics in Turkey. And the last speaker is uh, Nazan Istunda. She's a professor in the Department of Sociology at Boğaziçi University in Turkey. So welcome everyone. And um, so everyone will talk uh, approximately about 15 minutes. And by the end of the talks, we will open the floor for question and answers. And we're looking forward uh, to your comments. Thank you. First of all, thanks to Sarah and uh, Red Emma's coffee shop to organize this event to talk about Kurds and Turkey. Uh, it's not easy to talk about Kurdish issue because it's quite complex and complicated, which interests four different countries, uh, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. So I will try to keep it short, my presentation, and leave more space for Q&A so we can go more deeper on the, uh, to talk about the situation make it more easier to understand the issue. Obviously when we talk about the Kurds we are talking about 
international population, around 22 to 25 million persons living in Turkey. And Turkish population is 18 million. So in this reality, it's a population which for 100 years their main rights has been refused where you cannot call your Kurdish and you could not use your mother language and you cannot leave your culture. And in this hundred years, several times there have been uh, resistance against uh, the central government to get the, the Kurdish rights respect in Turkey. But unfortunately, some steps has been done, but a lot of steps didn't came. But to understand better that when this violation begins, it was with the constitution of the new Turkey, which was born in 1923, uh, which was more nationalist. And with the last decades, we have a Turk, other Turkey, which is most more religious and nationalist, which we are facing. I'm going to more speak about the last 10, uh, ten years, because Otherwise, it would be too long, my speech. Especially when we talk about the last 10 years, uh, we as Kurds and a lot of people in Turkey was hoping that uh, switching the power, who is in the charge of the power, which has been excluded from power as Muslims, could bring something different and better, which could make and respect everyone in the country. But unfortunately, more the Islamic groups get the power, more they can centralize their power and being strong in the system, they became to more exclude all of the other groups and uh, the differences. And uh, especially in 2009, they began a peace talk between the Kurdish movement and the central government to find a solution for Kurdish issue because also a lot of, uh, not only Kurdish population, but also the Turkish population was uh, had enough of the war which has going on for 30 years in Turkey. So there was a huge support for a uh, peaceful solution. But unfortunately when we uh, saw in this seven years the government was talking to do the steps but it was only trying to get more time to be more strong in Ankara and to get more power. And for that, we also as Kurds, we try to remain, to bring the government on the table so we can talk about it because we know that this issue can be only solved with uh, negotiation and with uh, peace talks and on the table. Even right now, when we see that uh, how our cities has been traded uh, on the curface, which when we go to see the image, of cities of Kurdistan of Turkey, they are not different from the cities in Syria, uh, which the violence has been on for a while. But when the AKP gets strong enough, and especially when we as Kurdish organizations, but as HDP, when we find out that we and with other components from Turkish society, together we was able to change and we was able to be a power which could bring the real change in Turkey, which everyone could be respected. And uh, even there was minorities, or even there was religious differences, or even they socially, politically things differently. So we had a successful elections in the last year against Erdogan, especially when he was trying to get absolute majority to, to change the constitution and get the presidential system which he was trying to get. And we as Kurds with the new components uh, uh, inside the Turkish society united together with a new policy, with a new vision for a new Turkey, we get doubled our electoral success which didn't give Erdogan absolute majority even to form a government. And from there we begin to hear from people around Erdogan who are saying that if this peace process is making me lose, why am I going to continue on this peace process? 
but in the same thing, in the Turkish policy, something other happens that the ultranationalist party in Turkey, MHP, and the, a good part of CHP, which was main opposition party, uh, when they saw this successful election for the Kurds, which broke up the threshold, which was 10% to be represented in the parliament, but not only that, but which was giving a hope for a different Turkey and with a new vision, and which was a new political power was able to grow, they decided together to stop this process. Obviously also a good part of the military power in Turkey get afraid about the Kurds advance in Turkish policy. That makes that give President Erdogan a possibility to see ah, if all of these groups together are angry about the, this new development in Turkish policy and which they are angry that Kurds will get their rights, they will divide Turkey uh, to a more softly way. So it's better to try to catch this uh, moment which is attacking the Kurds more and to get support from all of these groups. Unfortunately, when he decided to go to the second elections, he begins firstly to attack us as political party more than armed militant PKK members. So our 400 our, uh, offices around the country has been uh, attacked, burned down. Uh, our thousands of, of our active members has been arrested and several uh, bomb attacks which was done by ISIS but which was helping AKP in the elections like in Antep, in Mersin, in Ankara, in Suruj, which has created the situation that Erdogan became more saying that ah, oh, the ultranationalists in the beginning they begin to say he is doing the right fight against the Kurds and he will solve this problem as we want. And they softly begin to move forward to AKP. And in the same times, in some of the Kurdish voters also were saying, okay, this man won to be able to govern, and after that he will live in peace, everyone. That's why he's doing this hardline. Let's give him what he wants so we can be in peace. But unfortunately, after the November election, he got a success, but it was not enough to change the constitution to get the presidential system he wants. And that makes that uh, he has to push more on this line, which was going against the Kurds, showing more hard line. And in the same times, thinking about, okay, I leave the negotiation table behind me, but if I do more pressure, I will get this nationalist with me, and I will get the, uh, the system I want, which he was referring to some kind of Germany's Hitler's constitution. So it's quite showing his dictatorial ambitions which he wants to bring to the country. And at the same time, I will crash on the Kurdish cities I burn down in two weeks and I will get the control of the cities and that's the way so I can go back to the negotiation table to say, look, you don't have any other options. You have to do what I'm saying to you. But he didn't calculate it that the Kurds have been in fight for 100 years. And, when, and the first time in their story, they're seeing a light in the tunnel which can bring a solution for them. And they don't want to lose this moment. And we will do everything for to get them, even how hard it will be for them. So when you see the photos of the cities, he has destroyed totally. But at the same time, this I think is bringing the end of the Turkish representation in the Kurdistan. And it's divided totally the Kurds from Turkey, which obviously in some kind of way 
controversially helps also Erdogan in some situation because we think that Erdogan probably will share other early elections if he don't have the ability to go to referendum and change the constitution. In that case, with this destruction he has done in the Kurdish city, our electoral voters, they don't believe in a, a political solution and they will not go to vote. And that means our, all of our representations mostly will go to AKP and his political party. And at the same time, the way he has fighted against the Kurds, probably also ultra-nationalist political party, they will remain under the thresholds. So he get the absolute majority to get what he wants. And maybe we will see in the last uh, end of the year and other elections to achieve this goal, what he wants. But what I think what Erdogan is calculating wrongly is only that Kurdish issue is not only belongs into the Turkey. The feeling of the Kurds is not only in Turkey and the resistance of the Kurds is not only in Turkey. The situation which happens in Syria or in Iran will strongly influence the Kurds inside the Turkey. Because there's a discussion about maybe Kurdistan of Iraq will be independent. On the other side, maybe a federation for the Kurds in Syria. This will totally influence the reactions of Kurds most strongly inside in Turkey. But in the same times, it will influence Erdogan's ultra-nationalist voters. Because in that case, when they see they are losing ground totally in Syria against the Kurds, and which the Kurdish policy in Syria has success, and Turkey was not able to stop, Erdogan was not able to stop this, I think he will begin to lose the international votes also. And this can be a beginning for crackdown for Erdogan also in internal policy in Turkey. Uh, and beginning of the changement also inside in Turkey. Unfortunately, this situation of this reality of the violence is not helping so easily the, uh, to a democratic way in Turkey. Because what we are right now seeing in Turkey, uh, it's a situation which is not eliminating only the Kurdish factors inside the Turkey's society. He is eliminating all of the democratic whole who is making a position against him. So they will not be able to resist. Just last week, they cut off the signals of one of main of Turkish Kurdish television stations. Um, yesterday, they uh, take over uh, main uh, Islamic opposition parties news uh, groups newspaper. So also the press which was already 70% controlled by Erdogan, they don't even tolerate this 13% which is not controlled by himself. And otherwise also, I think there are Professor Stinda will talk about the conditions and the situation they are facing from their camp in the situation. Obviously, but for the Kurdish situation or perspective, it's more complicated because when you see a civil war, not civil war, but a war between state and the Kurdish population, and when they don't get enough support from the west of the Turkey, from the Turkish society, uh, it's dividing more, and it's giving more possibility for them to, uh, to move on that ground. But at the same time, it's making more harder our world as HDP, which was our slogan's world, together we can change and together we can respect everyone. It's making more hard for us to say in our territories in Kurdistan, which we get more majority of the votes, because the people doesn't believe anymore that. They say, well, we see in the west of Turkey, they are able to demonstrate for when they cut down a tree, but when they kill, mass kill the Kurds, they are not reaction for it, so we don't have anything to come and to share in this fight. This is making it more harder for us to, to, to bring that power because 
that together we will be able to face this dictatorship. If we remain more alone, and if they remain more alone, we will not be able to face the situation to change. This is another pattern which we, we have to face in the next five, six months to, to be able to, to really bring a new hope for change and to free from everything. And the other side, obviously, while we're in the United States, uh, nobody is happy with everything's government, but still military agreement is going on. Still, Turkey is using NATO's weapon, which they're not allowed to use against their own population. Uh, last week, just uh, Turkey signed an agreement uh, for 638 million dollars to sell B-18, uh, 180, uh, 108 bombs. That's shown some controversy. And I think that uh, what is making everyone more stronger is this controversiality of international policy. You see the United States from this side who's talking about the democracy, changement, and uh, human rights, but the other side when you see somebody is doing the same things which Assad has done and you give selling him bombs. And the other side you see European Union which is saying, I don't want our refugees, do whatever you want, but just stop them. Well, this is, has shown clearly that uh, it's not possible to make any pressure on Erdogan to change from outside when you don't have outside country which is not respecting human rights and democracy and so on. Let's stop here. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, Nick Tausik here. Uh, thanks for your attention. It's a big thing to sit down for a couple of hours. And I wanted first of all to tell you there are two books by the cash register that you might be interested in. Uh, the first is by the sage uh, of the Kurdish movement, uh, Ojalan. This is one of his many books, Manifesto for a Democratic Civilization. Uh, with uh, a very interesting introduction. <clears throat> and uh, the second book is one that a group of us in New York just put out, came out last week, it's published by Autonomy Media in uh, Brooklyn. It's called A Dear Imagining and consists of uh, something like eight essays, uh, three or four from New York people and the others from uh, Kurdish people in different parts of uh, Kurdistan and Europe. Uh, I wanted to talk myself about uh, a small, uh, uh, in an ethnographic sort of way, uh, that's uh, a teacher anthropology uh, about uh, which to stress the importance to focus on the importance of uh, the anti-patriarchal or feminist uh, uh, centerpiece, uh, as I see it, of Rojava and to uh, a large extent uh, Eastern uh, movement in Eastern Turkey. You understand, of course, they're very related. KK is classified as a terrorist organization, therefore it's often very difficult to talk about it. Uh, but uh, Turkey, as was described, has um, something like 75 million people classified maybe as Turkish and something like 20 million people cl uh, classified as, as Kurdish. There are Kurdish people in Europe, other places. Uh, Syria has a total population of about 15 million people and there's a little strip on the border with Turkey, uh, which we call, uh, always call Rojava, and has about two million people, just to get a bit of perspective. And you must think very much of the movement across across that border. ISIS people coming down from Turkey with the uh, implicit support of uh, the Turkish government, pretending it's fighting ISIS, uh, and other sorts of movements between Eastern uh, Kurdistan and Rojava, okay? Now, I really want to go back and stress again uh, the, the, the three principles uh, that developed uh, in, uh, I'll call it the Kurdish movement, in the 90s. And this was the celebrated, uh, uh, it 
seems sort of miraculous if you don't know the step-by-step -step developments of the ruptures uh, in uh, revolutionary thinking from a <clears throat> Marxist-Leninist, hierarchical, uh, Stalinist uh, organization, obviously male-dominated and male-centered, uh, up to the mid-90s, and then this sort of almost like overnight conversion uh, to a, a, a feminist, uh, stateless democracy, uh, extremely sensitive to ecologism, and a lot of that was to be found in the books of Murray Butchkin, the anarchist uh, philosopher uh, in, in Vermont. And there was a correspondence between Butchkin and Ojanan, who by that time was a prisoner at Oman Island in solitary confinement, nevertheless able to read and write. So you have to be very aware, I know some of you, or most of you are, about this uh, flip, this 180 degree flip from the top down by movement to the horizontal, from the male to the, to the, to the female. Uh, uh, Nazan uh, has told me uh, a couple of times about one of Ojanan's books, which is not translated, uh, which uh, she roughly translated as, uh, hang on to your seat, uh, killing the man within. Uh, Varman, sensational, uh, unforgettable. Ojanan posits in many ways a tight relationship between the patriarchal family and the, 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 the state, modern or traditional. So there's this tremendous pressure that if you want to get rid of the state, if you want to develop alternative forms, uh, what men are about and what men have been about and what family structures have been about for 5,000 years in the Middle East uh, has to undergo a change. Obviously, that's incredibly uh, momentous and, and difficult. I went to Kobani uh, when I was teaching in Istanbul in, February, in May of uh, 2015. Uh, I was guided by Nasan and uh, a colleague of hers, uh, Bulen Kochuk, both sociologists in uh, Wazichi. And, uh, I spent a mere three days there, I took a lot of notes, and I want to talk a little bit about the uh, way in which you might think of patriarchy in relationship to the YPG or the women uh, guerrilla. Uh, I might tell you that I've worked for 40 years maybe in uh, Colombia, where there's a strong guerrilla movement, uh, the FARC, and uh, I have a, a bit of experience in, in thinking about the relationship of men and women in such movements. Now here's what I, here's what I wrote. Uh, in Kobani, it's, it's sort of like a diary, okay? And I want you to get a sort of fine grained texture so you have a bit of a feeling of uh, what I experienced anyway, and hopefully it's valid in some important sense. In Kobani, the men's insignia on the, left, on the left upper arm of their camouflage uniform was a star on a yellow background. The women's, however, is green. For the environment, a woman combatant told me, flashing a smile some 15 kilometers from the front, with ISIS close by the other side of the Euphrates. Around the waist, female and male, there is often a traditional Kurdish 8-inch high waistband of patterned material, which in a striking way draws the body in, a body ready for action every inch. But there's also this narrow waistband over that, carrying grenades, uh, each with its big loop of steel that I guess is the pin you pull to set it off. A serene woman, aged about 30, with rimless glasses, told us how they kill themselves when death from ISIS seems certain. How? With her finger, she extracted a grenade from her belt. I noted a lot of techniques of the body, the thinness of men, how we slept, male and female separate, shoes off on entering the house, the toilet at floor level, shaped like a large keyhole over which you had to squat. This is a culture of the squat. Such hips. The food, especially the large rounds of wheat, flat bread, which serve as food, a spoon, and as plate, and wheat and rye were first domesticated in eastern Turkey. Kurdistan. 
eating on the floor with legs bent flat like the bread. Ouch. The insane amount of cigarettes smoked by the visiting health workers from Turkey, including the Turkish surgeon who was operating during the siege. Absence of alcohol and the absence of a call for prayer. But that wide waistband, with or without grenades, together with that technique of the body known as celibacy, more on later, is what sticks in mind. Was I, a nice suburban boy from white Australia, seduced by these women fighters with their aura of celibacy and suicide? I hear Janine in my ear as I write this sentence. Please note, the suicide is not suicide bombing. That's for ISIS. They were a tight bunch, these women, and much attention by visitors has been paid them, inevitably. For women warriors are, in this day and age, not exactly commonplace, outside of salacious photo ops. Indeed, for female guerrilla units in any part of the world, arouse all manner of questions, fear, adoration, and mythologies. The women spoke of collective suicide when ISIS surrounded them. They spoke of lying down to die on the body of a comrade dying on the battlefield, awaiting death with them. Of apologizing on one's phone when dying, while disposing of one's cell phone, codes, and weapons. The emphasis on self-immolation struck me as strange and made me anxious, all the more so because the women were so calm and confident. They also spoke of the ISIS people whom they hear on their cell phones, speaking mainly English or Russian, Chechens, not Arabic, and they related conversations, related conversations with them. We will behead you, they say. You are infidels and pigs, they say. Yet Isis is frightened by these women, a visceral, mystical fear. If killed by a woman, they will not go to heaven. The combatants were in their thirties, all in fatigues, the women doing all the talking. This was a mixed group of men and women, which is Rare. And in that group, when we visited Nasani and Bulen, the women did all the talking. Dressed in baggy pants called Shalvar from the mountains of northern uh, Turkish Kurdistan, one woman spoke English and had two brothers studying electrical engineering in Ivy League universities in the US. What do they think of their crazy sister? I asked. But before she answered, Nazan had a more pointed question, addressed to one of the silent men. Oh, Eva. Nazan had a more pointed question, addressed to one of the silent men whose face I drew because of its deep furrows. More furrows than face, you could say. Lines of history, lines of sun, lines of questioning. How have women affected your morale? Nazan asked him, direct and feisty in Turkish, as is her way. And the response, in abbreviated shorthand translation, which must make his answer seem a bunch Not so optimistic. During my interview with one of the defendants who was released by the end of his fifth year in prison, I was reminded of the arbitrary character of legal proceedings. When I asked him if the trial of democratic autonomy was over, he said, this state is revengeful, it never forgets. The courts had to release us, but the fight will continue on another level, end quote. By that time, this statement sounded way too, way too skeptical to me. The coming years, however, proved him right. What we observe today in Northern Kurdistan is the extension of this fight from courts to urban neighborhoods where democratic autonomy has been declared on the ground. What the courts could not achieve by law is now being pursued by the military and special police forces 
through the state of siege all over northern Kyrgyzstan, the excessive incarceration tactics are replaced by excessive military shelling of urban livelihoods. Those who did not submit to the state before the courts are now tried back by death. background, it does not come as a surprise that in the last three months, the special police forces assassinated a lawyer, a leading po female political figure, and a family member of another defendant whom uh, I had met in the hallways of the courthouse. The, contig the contiguity I draw between the politics by law and the politics by war does not imply that the repertoires deployed by deployed in the legal domain are the same as that deployed in the battleground. In the courtroom hearings I attended for two years, I witnessed how the judges utilized the language of law to silence the defendants. Now I want to play to you the video clip recorded by soldiers in a district of Shirnak called Siloki, where they silenced the whole town with the anthem called Commando Anthem. Mistreatment, 
it is necessary to get the approval of the Prime Minister and the Ministry of Defense. However, this video is not only a picture of the bestial character of the state, it is, it is also a spectacle that performs its own failure. It tells us what kind of sovereignty crisis the Turkish state encounters in Northern Kurdistan. It exposes naked the kind of force upon which the state order is maintained. One might ask where the people of Siloki are in this video. I believe they will return to the scene once again to set themselves from the state. Okay, I will show you a video. Uh, some of the uh, there are some dialogues, and the dialogues are either in Turkish or Kurdish, and you will not understand them. Uh, but that's okay. I just want you to see the scenery, and it's going to take a long time. It's five minutes, but please be patient because this is uh, this is right. This is a video taken. Uh, when the Cizre, Cizre is a town in northern Kurdistan in Turkey and Cizre was under curfew for uh, almost three months and uh, around 500 people died and two thirds of those people at least were civilians uh, and uh, all the houses were uh, burned down and destroyed so uh, the people are now coming back and this is the video Okay, just I asked her to, uh, to pause because uh, this is a basement. And they are, uh, have, I mean, what they are looking at are bones, uh, because in this basement only 60 people were burnt alive. <laughs> Aşyalarımız hepsi gitti, evimizi bozdular, silopya gittik, parasız kaldı, elbise hiç götürmemişti, şimdi çaresiziz. Ne yapacağımızı da bilmiyoruz. Sen niye evlere bize sahip çıkmadınız? 
Sadece başka sadece tek başına belki de Niye o gün gelmediniz? Siz adres verdiniz, onlar onları oradan öldürdüler. Haberiniz var mı acaba? against all this, to resist against all this. 
it's very difficult to feel power, to, uh, to think that you can change things. So we were in a state of silence for a long time. Uh, but uh, we were also uh, very, you know, watching what's going on in Kurdistan closely. And we are a group called P Academics for Peace, and we have this network was founded in 2012 when those that uh, people Sarah was talking about the 10,000 prisoners, 10,000 political Kurdish pr prisoners have started a hunger strike. And with that hunger strike, they were demanding that the Turkish state and uh, starts a peace process with Öcalan in Imralı. Uh, and yeah, uh, they were so they were doing the hunger strike for a for a peace process. And we have said we have declared 300 academics have declared. Okay, we are going to talk about the Kurdish problem and our demand for peace in all the conferences we attend and in all the lectures we will give, we give until uh, the demands of the hunger strikers are met. And that's how this network was created. Then in 2013, uh, the peace process started and from 2013 until the peace process collapsed, we have actively supported the peace process. Uh, even at times when it seemed that the government is not going to, I mean, it was obvious maybe the government was not going to meet certain standards, but we still thought we have to encourage the government, you know, we have to support the government to continue the peace process, so we have done many petitions. And even in the best times, in the most democratic circumstances, under most democratic circumstances, uh, we received for our petitions only 300 signatures. It's very difficult to mobilize academia, as you know. Uh, and so we had 300 uh, signatures. Then uh, during this, uh, when the curfews have started and civilians were being killed one by one, uh, we came together, uh, some of us, and we said, okay, what can we do? Well, giving a signature on this, under these conditions, writing a petition is ridiculous. People are being killed and we are going to write a petition and nobody is going to sign it because it's so repressive. Uh, but still we decided we are going to write this petition and, the, uh, and our, uh, I think this is relevant to you, our question was, we are going to do what we had expected American academics to do when the Iraq occupation was occurring. Because Iraq occupation was not very different from this. And we expected American academics to take a stance against the Iraq occupation, and it didn't happen. Uh, we, we were expecting Israeli academics to take a, a stance against Palestinian occupation, it didn't happen. Uh, and we said to ourselves, okay guys, we are going to do what we expected from Americans, what we have expected from uh, uh, Israel academics. And we wrote this very, I think, hard, very strong, I, I believe, I mean strong criticism to the government. As it, it said, we are not going to be part of this crime. We are never going to be part of this crime. And as citizens of Turkey, uh, we are telling the government to stop this right now. And uh, the first day, 200 signatures came, and I was shocked. Because, as I say, we, we were expecting that we will, find, we will maybe have 300 uh, signatures in the end of the first day. The third day, we had 1,200 signatures. We, and we realized, oh my God, it's not like these people are keeping silent because they want this to happen, but they are silent because they don't know what to do. Uh, and so we declared, we, we made a press statement and we, did, we uh, read our uh, petition and with 1,200 academics from everywhere in Turkey, from small fascist cities, from right-wing, you know, Islamic towns, all these academics, maybe one person in one university, two people in universities, and I really, really feel like they have given us a gift because afterwards they have lost their jobs 
and some of them were uh, people tried to lynch them. Uh, they had to run away from the towns and from the universities they were teaching. About 1,200 people have given this. And then we made the press statement, and I, we, after the press statement, we went to a cafe, and I was looking my, uh, at my Twitter, think, because the government, you know, when there is something oppositional happening, normally the best way to make it unhappen is ignoring that it happened. You know, you don't show it in newspapers, you don't show it in the t TVs, and it's like it never happened. But, and then I was looking at the Twitter and oh my god, I was so happy because the government's newspaper had tweeted us as traitors. And I then went to a meeting, I'm also part of uh, Women for Peace, uh, and we were having a meeting and I uh, rushed into the room and took the microphone and said, Guys, I have great news. They, we are news. They call us traitors. And everybody started clapping. <laughs> we were so happy. And the next day, for the whole day, the prime, although there was an ISIS bombing in the Sultan Ahmed, in the most touristic place in Istanbul, and a lot of people died, the president did not talk about that half a minute, half a minute. And he talked about us for 10 minutes, calling us the dark darkness of Turkey, uh, the uh, half academics, uh, traitors, uh, uh, ex uh, I don't know, all kinds of things, and it made us even happier. Uh, afterwards, uh, they have started taking uh, people in under custody uh, in different cities, they have taken tens of academics under custody and then uh, to, uh, in uh, private universities, because in state universities it's not that easy to fire people. It's like a tenure system. Uh, but in private universities it's not like that. So in a lot of private universities have started firing people. And as I said, people who are living in small cities, they had to leave, run away from their cities because they were threatened and their uh, offices were crossed with red, red crosses. And uh, two, they tried to burn down two offices of our friends. And we have, of course, went to their towns and got them out and brought them to Istanbul to our houses. And meanwhile, something, hor something wonderful happened. And what happened was that uh, suddenly groups kept popping out, uh, popping up in Istanbul. Suddenly, a group comes out uh, with 2,000 signatories, signatures, and they call themselves uh, engineers for peace. 300 people, a, a accountants for peace. 200 people, translators for peace, writers for peace, um, uh, tourism guides for peace, um, all kinds of people, health workers for peace, uh, journalists for peace, actors for peace, filmmakers for peace. So there were suddenly uh, around 30 different groups and we came together and called ourselves everyone for peace um, and we are still of course we don't have much effect I mean <laughs> this goes on continues from all over the world we got support thanks to all our academic uh, our friends in all over the world they have supported us uh, well I don't want to talk uh, more, I, I, I think it's better if we leave uh, time for Q&A session, but I'm just going to say one thing. Uh, people ask us, how can we support you? We ask the same question to, the, to Kurds, and Kurds always tell us, you can support us by resisting where you are. And we ask you to do the same thing. This is not something that is happening to us only. You are all implicated in this. This is a third world war. Oppressed people, women, against authorities, against sovereign states, against dictatorships. 
It started in Africa in 1990s and it's coming towards uh, West as well because the world is in a crisis, as we know. States are in crisis. Capitalism in is in crisis. And you are all implicated in this war. Uh, so we ask you, yes, thank you for supporting us, for giving us space here. But we ask you to resist where you are uh, as academics, as students, as writers, you know, resist against your governments, write petitions, uh, and it, what will make us stronger is your uh, action against your own governments, which are all implicated in these wars. Thank you. Thank you. 